Welcome to lecture 11 for regulatory frameworks. In today's lecture, we're looking at climate change. So this is a crucial topic for your future careers and one that I, I want to do a couple of things with. One, give you some takeaway skills in, in terms of greenhouse accounting, but also I want to set a broader picture because I think that climate change is an, is an such an important topic for your futures and for all of our futures and we shouldn't get too caught up in the detail of the current policy response because I think it's something like if we were to think about coronavirus if we were to try and think about global policies to deal with um, pandemics from 12 months ago and what they are now there's just been this rapid massive change so quickly and in ways that certainly I didn't imagine was possible. I'm sure many of us didn't imagine were possible. And yet that's the reality we're dealing with now. To me, climate change has all the hallmarks of coronavirus in the sense that there will be massive changes that we can't predict. And so look, getting caught up in the details of the current responses we can miss that bigger picture. So I don't want to lose sight of that. So this is our 11th lecture and one of the, uh, really the wrap up um, lectures for our course. I could spend the entire course talking about climate change. I talked about it in lecture one. I have mentioned it in other lectures like mining. I wanted to bring it in at this stage as a, as a lecture, but uh, obviously at, at present, most of your work in your careers is going to be in dealing with the detail of things like the planning system, the mining system, the laws and the policies and the practices that are going on right now. So that's what the bulk of our course is focused on. But climate change is such an important overarching uh, topic that I want to deal with it now before we finish the course. So in this lecture, the structure I want to take, I want to start with solutions because we can often get bogged down in uh, how oppressive climate change is and how the, the, the problems are overwhelming. I want to start with, briefly, solutions. And then I want to move on to look at basic science and climate policy. And we're going to, as we've done in other uh, lectures, draw this into some concrete examples, some concrete problems. So we're going to look at a power station, a landfill and a coal mine. And then in the context of regulating those sorts of activities, we're going to look at basic science relevant to policy settings, some of the international framework and particularly around the Paris Agreement and, you know, 1.5, 2 degree targets. But then I want to focus on the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act, which is Australian legislation which implements the international framework for greenhouse accounting uh, within Australia for activities and look at some of the nuts and bolts in that because that's the sorts of things that you might be involved in in the immediate future in your careers uh, but I'll set it also in the policy in within the policy I'll, I'll make some mention of other components of the current response to climate change but the the big message is that this response right now we shouldn't get too caught up in it or because it's going to change massively uh, it's obvious that it's going to have to change massively and that leads on to the final part that i wanted to cover in this lecture which is to look at thinking about future opportunities for your career and i want to tell you a story about work that i'm doing at the moment and how that could give you some ideas for what you might do with your careers using the skills you've got to fight for solutions. So that's where we're going. Let's start with solutions. And I want to start with the big question. How do we solve climate change? Well, if there's one thing I think we can do to solve climate change, it's this. We can make it a job. Because, as I've said in earlier, I think, lecture one, I think it's so important that we recognise that for environmental regulation, 
you nev it's never going to succeed. The, the things that require massive changes from society are never going to succeed unless they're linked to jobs and pos poverty alleviation. Because unless you do that, you'll never have the social support to sustain them. And climate change is a great example. Climate change policy in Australia is a great example of that, or a tragic example of that, because we are the only country in the world that has enacted a carbon price to then rip it apart. So there was a massive political battle in 2011, 2012, 2013 in Australia, where a carbon price was established and then torn down by the, uh, the, a party that won power uh, and on the basis of criticising the, the previous government's um, carbon price and calling it a carbon tax. So the previous government failed to sustain their policy and they lost an election over it. And then the current, well, it's not the current government, it's the current iteration of a government that started in 2013. Tony Abbott was elected prime minister, then it became Malcolm Turnbull. And then we've got our current prime minister, Scott Morrison. But essentially the same party has been in power, the coalition or the liberal and national parties in Australia, who were very anti-action on climate change. And they came to power in large part in a massive campaign against a carbon price. So the previous government failed to sustain its policies. And to me, the, the real message that you take from that is unless you link climate policy to giving people jobs and alleviating poverty, you're never going to win. You're never going to succeed. So I asked uh, over the weekend for some assistance and got some great assistance from five um, students from China and uh, an Australian student. In updating this idea, it was an article that I wrote back in 2013 about the idea of making not just climate change, but make, making environmental protection generally a job and how you sustain the political support for it. And the article was titled Environmental Protection Industry, A Job Creator. And it was about, at that time, the federal election was pending. The uh, Abbott government hadn't been elected. But I was looking at the policies of the government, the Labor government and the opposition government. Ironically, they were built around pillars for the economy. And I'd seen a story that was I thought was really interesting from China, which announced that it would elevate environmental protection to a pillar industry. That was what it was called in English. And it would receive government support in the form of tax breaks and subsidies to tackle dire pollution. And there were huge amounts of money involved. And I thought it was such an interesting story because apart from the fact that China is such a massive uh, country and so important uh, globally to the economy, to uh, environmental protection, it, it's important in its own right. But I also thought that there were some really valuable lessons in the language and approach that China was using for Australia and elsewhere. And so when I wrote that article in 2013, I was a bit taken aback because a lot of the comments in the article um, which was on the conversation website, criticised it by saying, oh, look, China, people fr either from China or who'd been working in China saying, look, the Chinese government always announces these big things. They never actually follow through. And basically, you're being naive to write about it. And I thought it was strange because I was really just writing about it as an idea. And, I, and yet I've taken... I'm conscious of the, that criticism. I'm conscious that obviously China is a massive country with a real focus on the economic development, huge population, huge environmental problems. Uh, at the time, there'd been this fascinating documentary uh, under the dome, which was by a Chinese journalist who had presented this it was sort of an Al Gore style seminar um, documentary where she was talking about the dire levels of pollution in Chinese cities and, and the huge health impacts that that was having on the Chinese population. And that documentary uh, was, was fascinating and, and, and horrific in the, the pollution that it talked about. 
But also, it, it, to me, the big message was the Chinese government had to deal with it because there is such pressure, even, even though obviously China um, doesn't have elections, it's not a democracy, the, the government of China is uh, the Communist Party and that's locked in. But still, the government of China has to listen to the people of China in the sense that if people are complaining about dire levels of pollution that their kids uh, and they are getting sick, well, that's a huge pressure on the government to respond. And so the government was responding with massive programs to try and particularly deal with uh, terrible pollution, both to air and water, uh, but also seeing it as positioning, positioning itself for um, research and industry in the future, recognizing that climate change was a major issue that um, the world needed to address, recognizing that there was a lot of opportunity for China to do research and then have the intellectual property to make it a cornerstone of its economy, which it could then sell to the rest of the world. So it was a, it was a dual economic and environmental um, policy approach. And it made sense back then that China would, uh, while imperfectly, no, no country ever succeeds in these things perfectly, that it would be a real push for the Chinese government to keep going with this. And so that was the context for asking um, about, well, how is China going? I, I wasn't able to really find uh, updates about the pillar industry. And I had some great responses. So thanks to everyone who responded, Audrey, Jamie, Yun, uh, Yim, and Zulin. Thanks for your responses. Can I just take out one point? I was, you, you guys did some really good research for me. Um, and I've just put here a, a, a screen grab of one of the pages about the 14th five-year plan and the uh, massive uh, investment in sustainability that's part of the um, 14th five-year plan. And I, can I just summarize it like this, that while China still suffers severe pollution and other forms of environmental degradation, it continues to plan and invest heavily in environmental protection. I think that that is uh, a, a important um, point to make, but it's the idea about making environmental protection a pillar industry and linking it to uh, the economy and jobs that I think is the really valuable take home lesson for other countries, including Australia. This sort of idea about making environmental protection and a pillar industry reflects, I think, a stronger version of back two decades ago, there was a big push at an international level under what was called the Millennium um, Ecosystem Assessment. And it was a big push to uh, recognize ecosystem services and basically put a value on the things that the nature and the environment provides to us. I was never really a fan of the ecosystem, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, um, but I think that China's approach of making environmental protection an industry or a pillar industry, I think is a stronger version of that. And ultimately, it's about linking environment not just saying environment protection is something nice that we do that's you know it's about saving koalas and it's something discretionary that we do but saying that actually it's crucial for our health it's crucial for our futures it's crucial for all the things that we want to achieve as a society there's also jobs in it there's money to be made and there are um, people can be employed um, doing the things like building new um, research into new um, power. Uh, if you're a chemical engineer, you know, you might be working on batteries in the future. If you're a planner, then you could be working on, say, um, sea level rise and planning for, uh, you know, how you say you go and work for the Gold Coast City Council, you know, working on how we deal with sea level rise and um, in, in planning. Similarly, environmental managers, uh, environmental scientists, there's a lot, a lot of work in dealing with these problems and dealing with climate change. And so if we see that and make it part of the conversation, I think that that's crucial for actually solving this. And I'd emphasize that good ideas come from many sources, including other countries like China. And, and I, I asked the question before uh, the weekend because I really just wanted to bring in 
um, this idea from China. I just think it's really valuable, even though I recognize that, you know, I'm not saying that China is, it doesn't have huge problems with the environment. I, the thing I want to say is, if we're going to solve climate change, we should make it a job, make it about employment, make it about we can solve this. And um, if we do that, then we'll, we'll build the political support for it. Okay, so that's solutions. And I might have surprised you there. You might have thought I was going to talk about solar and wind and all of that stuff. I think that that's a secondary issue to the big picture, which is if we make it about jobs and employment and a better future for the um, entire community, then we get this political support from it. And that's the only way we'll solve it. I want to turn then to deal with um, basic science and climate policy. And as I said, I want to ultimately focus on greenhouse reporting and um, the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act, because I think that that's a useful bit of knowledge to have now that's going to be relevant into the future. But I'm not going to get too caught up in current policy settings because they're all going to change. So the three problems that I just wanted to lock into to give us some tangible facts of the sorts of things that you know, you'll, you'll deal with in terms of climate change. So one is a power station. The f this power station is located about uh, 30 kilometres southwest of um, University of Queensland. In previous versions of this course, I used to run field trips out to um, the power station. I, I didn't run it this year for a range of reasons. Um, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to go there anyway with coronavirus, but um, here's some imagery from those field trips that I used to run. So here's Swanbank um, Power Station. There used to be a coal-fired power station, um, which is shown in this image, which there were different versions of it. This is Swanbank B Power Station. It closed around 2014 due to basically the, the value of it, the economics of running it, just not stacking up. Uh, in the foreground in this image is... Uh, Swanbank E power station, which is a gas-fired power station. So if I just change that to pen, so here's Swanbank B. It was a coal-fired power station. It's been uh, ended. And in the foreground is Swanbank E, which is a gas-fired power station. These are some of the cooling towers, uh, which, you know, for big power stations, you see those really big ones. Swanbank doesn't have those sort of massive um, cooling towers, but uh, you can see it in the foreground. So this burns gas to boil water and drive turbines. That's the basic idea. The second problem is a landfill. So we know about activities like coal-fired power generation and gas-fired uh, power generation, burning fossil fuels and contributing to climate change. But there's plenty of other activities that if we are responding to climate change, we need to regulate. And I just mentioned... Um, landfills, which are um, a really major um, source of greenhouse gases. So Rochdale Landfill is the landfill where all the rubbish in Brisbane goes to. So it's located about 15 kilometres southwest of UQ. And again, uh, used to run field trips there uh, in earlier versions of this course. This is if we focus in on it. Um, Rochdale has been around for a few decades and it uh, is a major landfill that takes all the rubbish from um, Brisbane and there's different cells, there's different parts that they're filling in and managing it. This is a new landfill under construction, so a new cell uh, in 2013. So the bottom is lined with clay and then layers of impermeable plastic to stop um, and limit groundwater contamination are then put down. So on one of the field trips in 2013, I took a picture from the bus of the construction of that um, cell. So, you know, if you are an environmental scientist or an uh, engineer, these are the sorts of um, activities that you might work on in the future, or obviously an environmental manager as well, with managing these sorts of um, big landfills. So uh, you can see there the um, excavators working, compacting, spreading out, uh, clay and other material to create an impermeable layer. So a modern landfill is constructed to prevent pollution getting away from it or leachate. So it's constructed with compacted clay, um, impermeable linings, and then they create cells within it. And 
modern landfills also will have um, collection pipes to take out the leachate and treat it and also to extract the gas from the decomposition of the rubbish. So as rubbish breaks down, it produces particularly methane gas and modern landfills uh, extract that gas. So green, um, methane is a potent uh, greenhouse gas and modern landfills extract that and then um, take it out and typically burn it and generate power from it. So here at Rochetow, this is a picture of some of the rubbish being unloaded. So when you put rubbish in a rubbish bin in Brisbane and then you put your bins out and a rubbish truck comes to pick them up, you'll see these sorts of trucks uh, coming around in the streets. So most of those trucks, unless they're really close to Rochdale, will go to a transfer station somewhere around Brisbane and then the rubbish from those smaller trucks is loaded into a bigger truck like this one, which then goes to Rochdale. The two trucks that are shown here, this um, little rubbish truck, the green one, would have been fairly close to Rochdale and it's come to deposit its load straight there. The bigger truck has come from somewhere else, from a transfer station. And then they have an excavator that goes around and basically breaks up the rubbish and breaks up particularly plastic bags. Uh, so that's sort of running around. If you, we, when I was there in 2013, um, this picture was taken from the bus. And so the excavator goes around and they break up the rubbish. And then each day they put some dirt over the top of it um, to stop birds and smells and those sorts of things. So there's a lot of environmental management involved in a big rubbish but it's waste. In the scheme like of that. things, we have invented so here's a, bit of um, a side tipper, which is actually like used in uh, basically the civil construction world, where you take a load of soil and a truck comes over, opens up its side and tips the actual soil out from the side. They have actually... Con so that was just a bit of the representative from Brisbane City Council speaking during that field trip in 2013. So the rubbish goes into the landfill and then um, it pulls out um, um, methane from the breakdown of the rubbish and it can do two things. It can either just burn it. So this is a flaring unit where it can just basically burn the gas and that converts it to carbon dioxide, which is, which is a less powerful greenhouse gas. Or it can burn it and generate electricity. So this, these generators over here with these little stacks, these are... Uh, used to generate um, electricity from burning the methane and then they export that power. So that's regarded as a, um, a green form of electricity in that it's yeah, basically produced from a waste and it's reducing greenhouse emissions. So that's a landfill power generation. The third problem that I just wanted to um, put on our radar to talk about when we come to greenhouse accounting is a coal mine. So I've talked about a few coal mines in the course. I'll talk about a different one in this lecture. So we've talked about alpha, we talked about, um, no, we didn't talk about alpha. We talked about the Adani coal mine. Uh, we talked about the Ackland coal mine stage three in lecture five. Um, I'll just choose a different coal mine that I've worked on. This one's called Wondoan, uh, which was located near the the town of Wandoan, uh, about uh, 800 or 600 kilometres uh, south, sorry, northwest of Brisbane. Sorry, I've got the figure up there, 350 kilometres northwest of Brisbane. So this is the landscape uh, in that area, a lot of um, cattle properties. This was a mine that was proposed uh, back in 20, 2008 by Extrata, um, which became Glencore afterwards. And these uh, colourful little shapes show different mine pits that were proposed uh, as part of the mine and the different colours represent the years when extraction would occur. So basically reds year one and then going through to grey year 30. So most of them would start at the north and work south. So these mine pits were about, the scale down here is, that's about five kilometres. So these mine pits are about five kilometres um, across. So they're big. So to put that in perspective, University of Queensland is one kilometre across. Four kilometres or five kilometres um, grid would basically take out from UQ to the Brisbane CBD, all of West End, all the way across to Woolloongabba. 
So that's what one pit at one Doan would take out if you put it in Brisbane. This is a sample pit near one Doan. Um, so this was, uh, you can see the overburden here and we're getting down to the coal, which is the black layer. So as you know, coal is the remains of fossilized plants, was captured from the atmosphere about 350 million years ago or 300 million years ago, most of the black coal in Queensland and when we dig it up and burn it we're returning it's, it's basically pure carbon when we dig it up and burn it we're returning carbon that's been out of the fossil sorry out of the um, active carbon cycle for over 300 million years and we're putting it back into the active carbon cycle so that's coal this is another a drag line at another big um, coal mine uh, extrata Bol extrata's bolga coal mine and what looks like a mountain range in the distance is actually just the other side of the pit. So, you know, four or five kilometer across pit is massive. So coal, um, when it's broken up, just looks like a, a black rock. And yeah, basically pure carbon. Okay, so those are our three problems. And I want to look at how we account for uh, greenhouse or climate change issues with those sorts of activities and then how they might be regulated. So... Uh, the first thing to really just touch on is some basics of climate science and climate policy settings. So we see why um, greenhouse accounting for these sorts of activities is important and the overall context within which it sets. So how are the greenhouse emissions from each of these activities regulated? So let's start with a brief overview of the climate science, just very brief. I want to just keep this really short, make it introductory only. If you wanted more detail, I gave a lecture on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, in a course I taught over summer, ENVM 7124. It's available on my website. If you wanted to you know, look at uh, the science in more detail, I'm just going to pull out some aspects of that and keep it fairly short. There's a lot of sources of information about climate change. I know you cover a lot of you guys cover it in other courses, so I'm not going to dwell on it here. I just want to touch on a few things. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fifth Assessment Report uh, is the latest report from the IPCC, so um, I won't dwell on that. Of course, there's still um, people that say, you know, climate change isn't real, it isn't happening. This is a, a cartoon that I <laughs> think is very funny of... A uh, little elf saying to Santa Claus, but the jury's still out on climate change, as you can see the North Pole over here floating away and the whole of the Arctic has melted. So I just simply say uh, in relation to that, look, it's important to keep an open mind about climate science, about uh, everything in your careers, but don't keep your mind so open that your brains fall out. So that is a quote or um, an adaptation of a quote that's very variously attributed to um, a whole range of people, Carl Sagan and others. So keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. So when we think about climate change policy and what the government should be doing about it, we should base our decisions on science, just as with coronavirus, the governments of the world in Australia, in China, uh, have been basing their decisions on science. That is, in, unless you're in the, as countries like, uh, yeah, it's really sad to see what's happening in the US with their madman, um, that's their um, president, and the uh, situation in Brazil as well as Indonesia. There's obviously countries that are in, still in a huge amount of um, problems with, with coronavirus. But in countries like Australia, we based climate and China and many countries in Europe, we based climate policy, sorry, coronavirus policy around science. And uh, at least at this stage, things are looking uh, reasonably good for the countries that have done that. So climate policy should be based on science as well, not basically what we would like the world to be like in our imaginations. So what I would call, we shouldn't build our climate policies around believing in the tooth fairy. So, and I've given the EGCCS as a reference to carbon capture and storage, which was about 20 years ago, carbon capture and storage was a popular proposal in Australia and other parts of the world like the US for allowing us to mine coal and gas. And then we would 
use it and then capture it and put it back underground. So carbon capture and storage. And basically in the last 20 years, we've found that that's really expensive to do and so expensive that it's really economically unviable. And even though in theory um, we might do it, it's actually far cheaper to just repower um, our energy and transport systems with renewables uh, rather than trying to use coal and gas and then capture it and put it back underground. So we shouldn't build our carbon, sorry, our climate policies around um, fairy tales. So if we think about the science, I really like this quote from a US professor, Naomi Oreskes. He said, there is a scientific consensus over the reality of anthropogenic global warming. It's based on multiple independent lines of evidence converging on a single coherent account. And I think that that is such a powerful statement. Multiple independent lines of evidence converging on a single coherent account. And to me, that's the best reason we've got for why we think we need to take strong action on climate change. Because there's multiple things saying, multiple independent lines of evidence saying, this is a big problem. So one of the basic lines of evidence is our understanding of how the atmosphere works, coupled with instrumental records of increasing atmospheric CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So if we think about our atmosphere, the greenhouse effect, I'm sure that you know this, I'm just going to run through it really quickly. The greenhouse effect is a basic property of our atmosphere. It allows sunlight to pass through. So we know that sunlight comes from the sun, passes through our atmosphere. The wavelengths coming in um, don't warm the atmosphere. They pass through it. A lot of it bounces out from clouds, but what doesn't get, get reflected out by, by clouds um, or the ice albedo effect around the Arctic or other um, ice or reflective surfaces, what doesn't get reflected out is absorbed by the Earth and warms it. And ultimately, that energy is radiated back into space in, um, in the form of infrared radiation. So it's a lower um, energy form of radiation. And that energy as it's passing through our atmosphere interacts with trace gases in the atmosphere and those um, trace gases act as effectively a blanket. They slow the loss of energy down and so they warm the atmosphere and the surface of the earth. And by increasing those trace gases, the greenhouse gases, we increase the warming effect. So that's the basics of um, the greenhouse effect and what we're doing, we're essentially in, in, increasing the blanketing effect of greenhouse gases. And we can measure major greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide we know has increased from, it was first recorded in the late 1950s um, by Richard Keeling and his results have become famously known as the Keeling curve. So since the 19, late 1950s, uh, the um, US government has been recording at um, Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, increasing uh, carbon dioxide concentrations. So this is the results from Mauna Loa. The latest reading is now at 416 or 417 parts per million. So an obvious um, trend going up, the little jaggeds, the little ups and downs, are due, due to the annual changes in um, essentially the Earth's seasons with the Northern Hemisphere moving in and out of summer and winter. So those levels are massive in comparison with historic levels of carbon dioxide. So over the last 800,000 years, carbon dioxide never got above 300 parts per million. And now we are at uh, 417 parts per million about here. And we're planning to go on massively further to possibly uh, over 500 parts per million, possibly over 900 parts per million. So that will be a massive change in a major constituent of our atmosphere. And we know that it's going to have um, big effects. 
So it's well, estab well established atmospheric physics is the basics, basis for our scientific understanding of climate change. And one of the things that I think is really, really scary and sobering is that this carbon dioxide that we're releasing from burning fossil fuels is going to continue the atmosphere for a really long time. About 7% of what we emit now will still be affecting the atmosphere in 100,000 years time. Yeah, the time frames are enormous. Even if we stop burning fossil fuels, there's still going to be legacy effects for millennia. Now, while some major changes are already locked in, what happens in the future depends to a large extent on what we do now and in coming decades. And so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and top scientists like um, this is from Malta Mainshausen's paper in Climatic Change in 2011, which was then used in the fifth assessment report as the basis of modelling. So the um, climate modellers now work around representative carbon pathways or RCPs. The um, one RCP is RCP 8.5, which is the idea that we burn all available fossil fuels going out to 2100. And then um, another RCP is where we basically leave a lot of fossil fuels in the ground and move to renewables and other sources of energy. So RCP 3 or RCP 2.6. So with those two broad RCPs in mind, um, going up to 2100, if we just looked at those two RCPs, um, this is what the concentration of carbon dioxide would look like in the atmosphere um, to 2100 and then beyond. So there's 2100. It's up around 900 parts per million, but it keeps going beyond that, um, possibly well over a thousand parts per million. If we don't burn fossil fuels, you know, we get off them rapidly, then we could potentially keep it beneath 500 parts per million. So those are the concentrations going out a few centuries into the future. And this is what the effect that will have on surface temperatures. So RCP 8.5 would mean global temperature rises something like 8 degrees by um, 2300 or the lower RCP keeping it beneath 2 degrees. So if the world was to change um, mean global temperatures by anything more than two, it would be devastating for life on Earth. So burning all available fossil fuels and going to that sort of RCP 8.5 future is um, yeah, diabolically bad. And we have got a lot of information that even current levels are dangerous. So James Hansen, a famous climate scientist, uh, wrote in, in research in 2008 that Basically, if we want to preserve a planet similar to that on which civilization developed, we should reduce current CO2 from, it was then 385 parts per million to at most 350 parts per million. So we've gone on since then, and we're now at 300, 417 parts per million CO2. Hansen's saying we should go back to 350 parts per million. And well, at least prior to COVID-19 in 2020, we were tracking around the RCP 8.5. So we're basically burning all available fossil fuels. So we haven't followed advice of people like Hansen and we're on a really dangerous path. path. And if present trends and policies um, continue, we're heading for something like a mean global temperature rise in excess of three or four degrees. So current international commitments um, put us on track for something like 3.5 mean global temperature rise. So I'm going to talk in, in a moment about um, policy targets in 1.5 and 2 degrees, but currently we're not on track for that at all. And yeah, um, we have to leave most available fossil fuels in the ground if we are going to preserve a livable climate. And uh, a little bit of extra context, in the last uh, 12,000 years, the, the climate has been remarkably stable. So this is um, mean temperatures for the last uh, 11,000 years from a paper, a famous paper by uh, Marcotte and others in Nature in um, 2013. And temperatures over the last 11,000 years had only changed by about half a degree until um, very recently. And that's significant because it's the last 
10,000 years when human civilization has flourished. So the last 10,000 years has seen all of the civilizations in China, in, uh, in uh, Central America, in South America, in the Middle East, all of those kingdoms that have come and gone, those early civilizations, that's all in the last 10,000 years. The pyramids of Egypt, the Great Wall of China, all of those things. So human civilization has flourished during this relatively um, stable period. And to put that in context, um, we came out of the last ice age about 20,000 years ago, and the temperature rose by about three degrees to the Holocene. And so that period of the last 11,000 years has been here. And that's when, yeah, human civilization has flourished. You know, um, back 20,000 years ago, humanity was being, you know, uh, yeah, the Ice Age was not kind to us. It was um, our, our ancestors managed to hang on, but it's the last 10,000 years when humanity has flourished. And we are now ending that and we are taking the world on a path that's going to radically change the mean global temperature. And we're already at one degree mean global temperature rise above pre-industrial levels. And we look like we're going to go up here to something like three or four degrees. So a similar sort of rise to out of the last ice age is what we're planning to go up. So that will cause huge impacts. Um, and yeah, emphasize the point. All of the evidence says that if we are going to keep beneath two degrees, we need to leave most available coal and gas in the ground. We simply can't burn it. Now, the idea of leaving most coal in the ground is completely alien in Australian politics. I've shown you this graph before, which is an Australian government um, planning document from 2012, where basically they were showing going out to 2035, um, rising exports of coal in black, um, rising exports of coal seam gas in red. So our idea was our, global, our national plan was to dig up and burn all available fossil fuels. And that still pretty well is our plan. Now, even at current levels, uh, it's having huge impacts. We have seen major impacts on coral reefs around the world. And this is a, some images of what coral reefs look like now at about one degree, still relatively healthy. Um, at two degrees, it's expected the middle image there, uh, coral reefs will be severely damaged. And at three degrees and above, they pretty well won't exist. This is from a paper by Ophir Goldberg and his colleagues writing in 2007 in Science and their um, projection of what coral reefs would look like under different climate scenarios. So um, coral reefs are already hugely damaged. We've seen mass coral bleaching events uh, globally and affecting the Great Barrier Reef in 1998, 2002, 2016, 2017, and most recently, 2020. We've also obviously seen very recently in Australia, massive bushfires substantially driven by climate change. So there's a whole range of impacts on coral reefs, on the Australian ecosystem with bushfires, on the Arctic. Um, we're seeing a whole range of impacts. To me, the focus has been on the Great Barrier Reef um, because that's where I'm from. And, and I think it's such a iconic system that we can use to rally action. And I just can't believe that we would just let it die on on our watch you know while we are in charge that we would destroy this magical ecosystem that's so valuable and not leave it to our kids so i've would suggest that the only test that we need to ask in australia for our climate and energy policies is this will we leave the great barrier reef for our children and if the answer to that isn't yes then you know there's something bloody wrong with our current policies. And the tragedy is that the answer that we're currently giving to that is not even close to yes. It's a resounding no, we're not going to leave it. So that's some background on science. Um, just want to fill in really briefly the international response and the Paris Agreement, just so we touch on that. And then we might take a break before we come back and look at accounting. Okay, so really briefly, um, at an international level, so for the last 
30 years, the global community has recognized that climate change was a problem that needed to be dealt with through collective action. So back in 1992, um, pretty well every country in the world signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which established a broad framework that it was a, the idea was that there would then be more detailed documents and agreements come under it. It had an objective of avoiding dangerous climate change. That was its objective. It didn't have, it didn't actually refer to two degrees, but since then, two degrees has become the major um, international goal. So the idea is that we will um, keep mean global temperature rises beneath two degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels. So that's been a major goal um, more recently in the Paris Agreement, there's all been, also been a push for 1.5 degrees. But two degrees for the last decade has been the, the big number that countries have used. We're already at one degree and we're seeing massive impacts. We're seeing massive impacts on um, coral reefs. We're seeing the massive impacts on the Arctic. Um, the idea that we'll go into two degrees in many ways seems crazy when you look at the impacts we've already got but that's the objective that's been locked in so you know of the Paris Agreement which was uh, an agreement reached under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 2015 in Paris and in it the global community agreed that the target would be to keep or hold the increase in global average temperature well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and an aspirational target of 1.5 degrees. So those are the targets that have been set internationally. At present, the what are called nationally determined contributions, uh, the global policies um, to try and achieve those targets aren't on track. If you add them all together, they and if we're successful um, with, the, with implementing those nationally determined contributions, the world is still going to warm by three degrees so we're not achieving the policy settings, uh, even um, with current commitments. Again, I don't want to go into these uh, NDCs and the like in too much detail. If you're interested in that, you can go and have a look at the lectures from the International Regulatory Frameworks course, EMVM 7124. So that's a broad policy setting. I just want to dive in to look at um, greenhouse accounting in particular. Uh, let's, how's the time going? It's um, 9.50. Before we turn to the national response and greenhouse accounting, um, do you guys feel like a break? Yeah, sure. Okay, why don't we take a 10-minute break and we'll I'll pause the recording. Welcome back to the second half of our lecture. Before the break, I was talking about some a brief overview of key science and um, policy targets for the purposes of then going on to look at our uh, regulation of uh, greenhouse gases and climate change in Australia in particular and focusing on greenhouse accounting. I was trying to keep it really short and so I cut out a lot of material that I didn't include uh, in longer lectures on climate change but I felt um, that I, there was one thing that I wanted to clarify that I hadn't addressed and that I think is really important to understand and really commonly misunderstood. So I just want to add one more thing. And that is, the com it's commonly misunderstood that a one or two degree mean global temperature rise is not dangerous because we experience daily, daily temperature rises that are much greater. So you know, today in Brisbane, the temperature might change by 10, 10 or 15 degrees. And so when we, we set policy targets around reducing or avoiding mean global temperature rises of one or two degrees, people can think, well, that's not very much. One or two degrees, that's not a, much, that's not a very big change. I just wanted to clarify that that is actually a massive change because the distribution of temperature is what's being shifted, not the daily temperature. So, and there's a, a crucial difference. So when you see a graph like this, it's talking about mean global temperature rises for the last few centuries and going up. So this is the temperatures from all around the world. When we shift the distribution, we push it all to one side. And if we think that uh, temperature uh, has a normal distribution, so like a bell curve, you're shifting the entire bell. So things that were 
the average temperature, that whole average is shifted up, but also the entire distribution. So what was previously things that occurred virtually never suddenly are occurring much more commonly and things that never occurred before are even even occurring. So you get more hot weather and more record hot weather. And that's the danger. It's the tails, not just the average, but the tails. Also, we expect that with climate change that we'll have an increased variance. So it's like squashing the bell. So when you put those two things together, you increase the mean and you increase the variance, you end up with much more hot weather and much more record hot weather. And this is the danger part of the distribution. It's the record hot weather that is yeah, hugely damaging to us and to the ecosystem. And one uh, animation that I think is really cuts through and shows this is this animation of shifting distribution of summer temperature anomalies in the Northern Hemisphere from 1950 to 2011. It was produced by James Hansen and his colleagues back in 2012. And it shows the change in distribution from this normal distribution in, in the 1950s. It shows how it's shifted. So this is for uh, North America, China, Europe. So this is it in the 60s. This is the distribution of temperature. Then the 70s, then the 80s, then the 90s, and 2011. So that's not a model. That's the record of how temperature distribution has shifted. So importantly, this area up here, things that never occurred before are now occurring and occurring quite regularly. So that's the danger. It's the shift in the entire distribution. So when we talk about a rise of one degree now, we can actually already see it in the, this shift. And this is some graphs from Australia showing rises in minimum monthly temperatures and maximum monthly temperatures, or actually I got that the wrong way around, maximums on the left, minimums on the right. But essentially that we've seen that same sort of shift in distribution in recent decades. decades. And so when you get these extreme periods happening, you see increases in extreme heat waves and fire conditions. So this is increasing um, extreme heat waves and fire conditions in Australia from 1910 to 2017. And of course, 2019, 2020 would have blown this out of the water again. So those are the extremes. And that's why in Australia, we've seen uh, the 2019, 2020 um, bushfire season was catastrophic. And it's that extreme um, that's driving it, uh, coupled with uh, dry, uh, drying conditions. Um, so extreme drought combined with uh, extreme temperatures driving catastrophic bushfires. So climate change had a substantial role in those um, catastrophic bushfires. And also around the world, so this is um, an image of fires in California in 2017. So California has been experiencing massive fires as well. Other parts of the world have as well. So it's that change in the distribution that's dangerous. That's also what drives uh, increases in cyclonic activities. So you know that cyclones are what we call, tropical storms are called cyclones in Australia, uh, hurricanes in the US, um, typhoons in most of Asia. So uh, cyclones, typhoons or hurricanes, tropical storms get most of their energy from um, sea, the sea surface temperatures. So if you increase uh, temperatures of the ocean, you expect stronger storms. So uh, yeah, massive tropical storms uh, driven by extremes and the shift in distribution. Similarly, um, coral bleaching uh, occurs in extreme temperatures. So this Acropora coral here, um, a picture taken in December 2014, and then the same area in February 2015. So bleaching occurring due to extreme temperatures uh, causing yeah corals to bleach. They don't stay bleached, um, so they don't stay white. They look pretty to start with. So this is an area bleached in 1998. A couple of years later or four years later, it's covered in algae. Um, another couple of years later in 2004, you can see corals starting to recover. But with repeated bleaching, we expect coral reefs to basically be wiped out. So it's the extremes uh, that are what's going to kill us and kill the ecosystem. So when we think about uh, policy goals 
of 1.5 or 2 degrees, don't be drawn into the misconception that that's a small change. It's actually an enormous change for the entire ecosystem, the entire globe. So if we think about the response to um, climate change, shifting to that, and as I said, I wanted to focus on uh, particularly on greenhouse accounting because that's something that's useful, going to be useful going into the future. But if we just summarize really briefly Australia's national response, going back for the last 30 years, we've had a series of prime ministers, Bob Hawke, uh, Paul Keating, John Howard, then there was um, Kevin Rudd and Julie Gillard, Tony Abbott, uh, Malcolm Turnbull and Scott Morrison as our present um, prime minister. So a couple of the prime ministers tried to take action on climate, um, but most of the, our recent leaders in Australia have really fought against taking action on climate change, really going on from Keating, um, Howard for a decade, and then Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison are particularly bad, basically trying to protect the legacy fossil fuel industries and uh, stop uh, strong action on climate change has been essentially the hallmark of recent governments in Australia. And amidst all of that, uh, what I want to focus on is um, greenhouse accounting, because that's something that does actually um, is something that's useful to understand, because our current response is hopeless. It's we're not dealing with climate change, we're promoting uh, mass extraction of fossil fuels and, and uh, it's unsustainable. We are going to, I really think if we think about where we are now and in the Morrison government, it's like um, trying to think about the global response to coronavirus based on you know, um, policies from a year ago. Uh, you can't make sense of where we are now with coronavirus based on past policies. So things have changed rapidly and they're going to change rapidly in the future with uh, climate change because the impacts will be horrendous. So and in that context, I think coronavirus gives us a ray of hope that our governments can take strong action when it's uh, becomes clear to them that there is no alternative, that you know you have to take dramatic steps um, that have huge economic costs because the alternatives are far worse. So coronavirus, to the extent that we can draw hope from it, uh, I think that it's possible that we, um, you know, gives you hope, gives me hope anyway, that we can reset our policy settings on climate change. So. Uh, any The current regime, I think, is hopeless, but one aspect of it is going to be a cornerstone for policies going forward, and that's what I want to focus on, which is greenhouse accounting. So we can't regulate, we can't deal with climate change unless we can count greenhouse gases, account for it, because you can't restrict an activity that emits fossil fuels or put a price on carbon or do anything unless you can actually quantify how much is being emitted and by whom. So you have to have a framework for accounting for those greenhouse gases. Internationally, the international community under the Framework Convention on Climate Change and then under the Kyoto Protocol came up with an international framework for reporting on greenhouse gases. Australia has implemented that international framework into our national laws into the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act of 2007. So in focusing on this act, it's also useful for uh, any, anyone that's coming from overseas um, because it's an example of a country implementing an, the international regime. So you can find out more information about this uh, on the NGRA, so the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act website. There's an Australian Government Clean Energy Regulator. I'm just gonna summarize it. So. Under the Kyoto Protocol, which was um, one of the, you know, I'm sure you've heard of it, a subsidiary agreement to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, which the Paris Agreement is also. So the, the targets for 1.5 and 2 degrees come from the Paris Agreement. The Kyoto Protocol was agreed back in uh, 1997 in the Japanese city of Kyoto and tried to set... Um, some 
a period from originally from 2008 to 2012 where developed countries would limit their greenhouse gas emissions. It's largely failed uh, to... Um, the US never ratified it. There were big problems with it. Led to a lot of acrimony. Um, we're now onto the Paris Agreement and the voluntary contributions of countries under the nationally determined contributions. But the thing that we can still take from the Kyoto Protocol is the reporting framework, which was built around uh, four greenhouse gases and two classes of gases. So carbon dioxide is the most famous greenhouse gas, methane, um, CH4, nitrous oxide. Um, another gas, sulfur hexafluoride, is another major greenhouse gas um, commonly used in medical and electrical applications. There's two classes of gases. So hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs and perfluorocarbons are classes of gases. So it's not just six gases. There's actually lots of these. So these six, what, they, what are called the Kyoto gases, these six um, gases, I'll call, even though there's two classes, I'll just call them six gases. These six are the um, gases that countries have to report on. Each of them has different effects on the climate, so they have um, given different uh, numbers. If you emit a ton of carbon dioxide, it's, uh, or if you emit a um, ton of methane, it's about 23 times as powerful over 100 years as emitting a ton of carbon dioxide. So they have different effects, uh, but they're the the basic things that have to be reported for greenhouse accounting. So as I said, the different greenhouse gases have different effects over different time scales. So sulfur hexafluoride, SF6, is about 23,900 times more powerful than carbon dioxide over 100 years. So SF6 is, as I said, used in um, high voltage electrical systems and medical, um, some medical applications. And yeah, it's a very pow powerful greenhouse gas. So when we're accounting for greenhouse, these different greenhouse gases, we use a unit called carbon dioxide equivalents or CO2E. So it's a unit that allows emissions of all greenhouse gases to be compared in a single unit. And so carbon dioxide equivalents is an important unit to be aware of. So when you see reports of emissions from, say, a country like Australia reporting greenhouse emissions by sector, they're reported in millions of tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents. So this is including carbon dioxide, methane, soft hexafluoride, perfluorocarbons, everything. And then you've got them in these different sectors. So carbon dioxide equivalents is an important um, concept to be aware of. Now, within using that basic unit, the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act in Australia set some thresholds for companies and corporate groups to report their emissions. It's not just emissions though, it also requires them to report energy use and uh, consumption of energy. So this was uh, only an indirect measure for uh, carbon, you know, climate change or activities that impact on climate change, but that's what the Act does. It's emissions, uh, if, you emit, if you're a corporate group, so this is companies in a, in a single group, um, so like a main company with subsidiary companies, if they emit over 50,000 tonnes of CO2 a year, then they have to report. If they produce more than 200 terajoules of energy or consume more than 200 terajoules, they have to report from all of the facilities under their operational control. Now, that can be really complicated. So Brisbane City Council, I did a report for them years ago and They've got thousands of facilities, libraries and the like. They actually get over those thresholds and have to report. It can be really complicated for big, org big organizations to report their activities. Um, also, individual corporations that emit over 25,000 tons of CO2 a year or produce over 100 terajoules or consume over 100 terajoules of energy also have to report from a single facility. And there's different methods that are used for reporting. So basically going from method one to method four. Method one is a, def a default method. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment. Basically, you can calculate emissions if you know the amount of fuel you've used. And um, 
the other methods become much more specific and method four involves direct monitoring of emission systems and it's a much more onerous system. But if we thought about method one, um, this whole system is built around a widely used international framework for emissions reporting based on scopes of emissions. So scope one emissions are direct emissions from an activity. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions from an activity due to electricity consumption. And scope three emissions or are indirect emissions from upstream or downstream um, an activity. So for scope one emissions with say um, the lecture today, um, we don't have any scope one emissions in that we're not you know, producing carbon dioxide um, directly, but we have scope two emissions because we're using the internet, uh, I'm running a computer, so we're using electricity for me, that electricity is probably coming from solar panels on my roof at the moment, but the lecture, we've, we're using some power to, uh, you know, to move the lecture around over the internet. So there'll be indirect emissions with our activity today and their scope two emissions. Scope three emissions um, might be, you know, the emissions embodied in things like the computers and the infrastructure that's involved in the lecture. Um, so scope three emissions. So scopes one, two, and three are commonly used uh, in reporting. And the NGR Act is built around scopes one and two. You can read about that on the, and there's the greenhouse gas protocol is an international framework that's commonly used. So a lot of companies use those scopes. And here's just an example of reporting scopes one, two, and three from a energy company in Australia called Energex. It's a Queensland government owned corporation. It provides network services and infrastructure to distribute electricity into homes and businesses around Southeast Queensland. So in, in this lecture, we're using um, Energex's infrastructure. And here's just part of a report that they produced um, a few years ago, talking about their scope one emissions from um, their trucks that drive around uh, scope two emissions from electricity use within their facilities and scope three emissions sort of thing things they've included there are employee air travel taxi travel and the like and waste disposal so those are things that if you think about direct emissions from their activities driving a truck around that might be burning diesel so that um, produces direct emissions from their activities that's a scope one emission um, their facilities use electricity um, that's produced off-site, so those are scope two emissions, and then things like their staff traveling on a, on a plane or something like that for a meeting. Well, the uh, emissions are pro being produced by another company in that case, but um, Energex is getting the benefit of it indirectly. So air travel, taxi travel are commonly uh, included in scope three emissions. And so this is the sort of report you get uh, from companies about um, their greenhouse emissions. And again, for you guys, if you're an environmental scientist or a chemical engineer, you know, these are the sorts of reports that you might be writing in the future. So um, cal uh, calculating a, a company's um, greenhouse emissions around those scopes. Can I just give you a couple of examples of how method one works uh, to give you the basic the basics of the most simple forms of greenhouse accounting. So method one uh, uses this formula and it's comes, this comes from the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Measurement Determination. And if you wanted to look at those, you could go to that website for the clean energy regulator and look at the, the technicalities of them. But for our purposes, I just wanted to show you one example of calculations. So um, I just mentioned two, I'm going to use this for power station, but uh, under the reporting framework, um, power stations can't use method one. They have to use a, a more advanced method. But for simplicity here, I just want to use um, method one. So in this um, formula, E is the amount of emissions. Q is the amount of fuel you've used. EC is the energy contact content. Um, EF is the emissions factor, and then it's divided by a thousand for the right units. So E is the emissions of greenhouse gases, Q is the quantity of fuel, EC is the energy content, and EF is the emissions factor. Now you can get EC and EF depending on the fuels, 
from tables that are included um, that are based on averages from fuels from a particular sector. So in Australia, black coal um, that's burnt has an energy contact or EC of 27 uh, gigajoules per ton. And then emissions factors are broken into um, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. Now, you're meant to calculate each one separately and then add them together. But can you notice that carbon dioxide is the massive... So if you burn coal, you basically get carbon dioxide. You get a small fraction of methane and you get a small fraction of nitrous oxide. Can I pretty well just knock them out for simplicity? And let's just add a little bit to 88.2. Um, so I'm going to make it 88.4, which so this isn't mathematically correct, um, but close enough for our purposes. And I know that <coughs> the um, engineers are listening to this, you're rolling your eyes at, um, at this, uh, uh, math the mathematics of bringing it all together. Just bear with me. I just want to keep it simple. Um, so we've got E, the amount of emissions equals the amount of fuel by EC, by EF. So um, the amount of fuel Swan Bank used to use um, per year when it was operating was about uh, 419,000 tonnes of black coal. So we multiply that by 27, the EC for black coal, and then an EF of 88.4. And then we divide it by 1,000, and that gives us a little over a million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions from burning that coal. Now that, in a nutshell, is the most basic form of calculating greenhouse emissions. You start from a known amount of fuel, whether it's coal, um, a liquid fuel like diesel, or a gaseous fuel like um, natural gas. You multiply it by um, uh, some factors that have been calculated to uh, give you its uh, total greenhouse emissions. Now, that is really useful to understand because in an operation like a power station, it's really difficult to calculate emissions once they're emitted. In fact, it's impossible. But you know the uh, amount of fuel you've used because you know, you've got records of that because your company's had to buy them for one thing or mine them if they're mining and burning the coal. So you know how much coal you've used so if you can now calculate you can use that amount of fuel to then calculate your emissions well that's then gives you a way to account for the emissions from that power station so calculating emissions from a given quantity of fuel is relatively easy calculating fugitive emissions from activities such as coal mines and landfills is much more complicated so i've just stuck with the most simple um, calculation just for our purposes if we look at something like Rochdale Landfill, this was from a report by Brisbane City Council in 2009. So here, this was a reporting under the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act. So the scope one emissions from the landfill was 96,905 tonnes of carbon dioxide. So those are direct emissions. Scope two emissions, a bit of power that was used from the grid. And then um, it's... Uh, that's sorry that's the total of scope one and two that's not scope three they've got energy consumption and energy production so we know that those are necessary to um, give us uh, or their, their triggers as well under the national greenhouse and energy reporting act when you break those emissions down by different gases it's uh, only a little bit of carbon dioxide most of the emissions are from methane and then there's a fraction of nitrous oxide no perfluorocarbons no um, or hexafluorocarbons, um, no sulfur hexafluoride, and no, yeah, so no, um, none of those others. So it's mainly methane, which is what you'd expect coming from a landfill. Now, when I was going out on field trips to it, uh, the landfill, this was a graph that was put up, and I'll just show you it briefly. So the landfill actually said, well, we produce, um, this is greenhouse emissions. I think the next one shows it clearer. So annual greenhouse emissions, yes, we emit about 90,000 tonnes of um, CO2 emissions from um, methane, 
but we also are sequestering that is we're capturing a lot of um, greenhouse gases that are trapped and won't escape and also we're saving a lot of emissions by um, burning them and converting them to carbon dioxide so this is a graph showing those um, activities as well as the emissions so it's not just um, positive there are some negatives where they can take off so these activities uh, are significant for this landfill in producing um, power but reducing the overall emissions that's what I'd like you to take away from that graph so these are significant activities so those are you know those are activities that are already occurring part of the response to climate change part of um, mitigating climate change impacts that are in place right now in Brisbane. If we look at a coal mine, then you can calculate its emissions from, say, digging the coal up, there's scope one emissions with that, um, and driving trucks around, there's scope one emissions with that. There's also, they typically connect to the grid, and that then uses significant amounts of power when they operate their drag lines and the like. When they sell the coal overseas, um, that's a scope three emission and it's been really controversial in Australia whether you whether we should consider those emissions when we are assessing the impacts of a coal mine or not and uh, though that debate around scope three emissions has been something that I've worked on a lot in cases over the last one and a half decades uh, and was has been a major fight last year there was a court decision in New South Wales about um, a coal mine called Rocky Hill which uh, rejected a coal mine based on its emissions of scope 3 emissions and it's been controversial it's a fantastic decision I thought by the judge Judge Preston but um, the New South Wales government has, has been considering laws to um, repeal that, that um, from being considered so those laws haven't yet passed or been decided but there's a real there's an ongoing fight about whether Australian, Australia, when assessing its coal mines, should consider the burning of the coal or not. Uh, and it's yeah, a big, it's a significant debate. The, the argument from Australian coal mines is if we don't produce it, someone else will. So there'll be no uh, emissions of greenhouse gas or no additional emissions if it comes from here. And yeah, I, I have used in the past, described that as the drug dealer's defense. If we don't supply the drug, someone else will. It doesn't work very well if you're a drug dealer, but it works well if you're a coal miner. Um, there's recently been an article written by a colleague of mine at UQ, uh, Justine Bell-James, and another um, colleague at UQ uh, uh, who talked about this in the Environmental Planning Law, Law Journal as um, the market substitution argument. And yeah, it's a still an ongoing debate in Australia. Should you take into account the burning of coal from a coal mine or not? So if you look at something like the Wandoan coal mine, if you ignore the burning of the coal, that's about 99% of the emissions associated with an activity. So you can see why the government and the miners want to ignore it because this is a cartoon showing Kevin Rudd at the time and... I don't know if that, who that is supposed to be, Martin Ferguson or someone else. But basically, uh, it was a cartoon jokingly saying the coal offshore sequestration. We basically um, put our coal on a ship. We send it to um, China, to Japan, to India. It's burnt there and it's no longer our problem, um, which, yeah, is black humor because uh, obviously it still is our problem. We've got the same atmosphere. If it's burnt in China or in India, it still impacts us. So in Australia, there's been this huge debate around climate policy. It's still, it's been hugely acrimonious for two decades. The low point or the high point was a carbon price, which was brought in in the Clean Energy Act in 2011. It was called the carbon tax. Uh, and Julia Gillard, the um, person who's shown in the middle there, um, was the prime minister at the time. The opposition leader was Tony Abbott. He ran a very effective campaign to pull down Julia Gillard based on um, acts, the tax and the like. It was a very acrimonious uh, political um, fight and the scars of it are still born today. Um, and the current government is um, Scott Morrison has is in the same party as Tony Abbott. 
And yeah, we still have the remnants of that acrimonious debate holding back Australia from taking action. So if we um, leave aside that um, debate for a moment and just think about um, the NGR Act again, the um, libel entities under it, we're thinking about these activities, the libel entities is a person with operational control of a facility over 25,000 tonnes of CO2, uh, a retailer of natural gas and um, a person with operational control of a landfill facility of over 10,000 tonnes of CO2. So those are scope one, scope two, oh no, sorry, scope one, scope three um, emissions because um, that was, um, sorry, I've misexplained that. Can I just backtrack a, a fraction? Um, can I leave aside that previous um, point about libel entities? Um, I, I don't want to go into that. Um, I'm just going to, I want to leave, I want to try and keep this uh, focused on current policies and current takeaway points. If we just think about our um, three entities, um, so we've talked about scopes, we've talked about thresholds for being liable for reporting. There was a carbon price in one period that's been repealed in Australia. So you still have to report your emissions, but you don't have to pay for them. So if we think about the scales of these sorts of activities, for the power station, it's emitting about 1 million tonnes of CO2 a year. Rochdale is emitting about 96,000 tonnes of CO2 a year. The Wondowan coal mine is about um, 589,000 tonnes of CO2 a year from simply from scope one emissions. So that's not including um, the um, burning of coal overseas, that's simply the activities of mining the coal. So each one of those activities is way over the 25,000 tonne reporting threshold. So each one of the companies operating them would have to report their emissions under the ANGER Act. They're over the 25,000 tonnes threshold. In Australia, we moved from the carbon price to uh, what was called direct action. And then we've got an emissions reduction fund which you can read about um, on the government website if you want to, but basically it's key point is there's no penalty or cost for not participating in that fund or exceeding a baseline or historic emissions. So all of these activities wouldn't have to pay a penalty for exceeding uh, its baselines. There was a, an attempt to build that in, but recent practice has shown that the government is not imposing any costs on companies for their emissions. So, um, yeah, we've got this reporting framework um, critique. Um, you know, when we had a carbon tax, the idea was polluters would pay us with direct action and the emissions reduction fund, we pay polluters. Um, and yeah, a lot of criticisms of current policies. I don't want to dwell on them because can I just summarize it like this? Our current policies are little more than a fig leaf for inaction on climate change, if you think about it just a fig leaf. I'd also criticise even the Labor's carbon tax as inadequate and little more than boxer shorts. So it still wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to solve the problem. It's a lot better than um, the fig leaf that the current government has, but it still left a lot of work to be done. So I don't want to dwell on the details of it. The main thing I want you to take away is the idea about um, carbon accounting, because that's going to be something that will be useful for you in the future. Um, the big picture, though, is um, we're going to suffer a lot of damage. It's going to affect your careers and affect your futures. And as I said, the, the test I think we should have for our climate and energy policies is this. Will we leave the Great Barrier Reef for our kids? No is the answer we're currently giving to that. No, we're not going to leave it for our kids. We're basically going to burn all available fossil fuels. And that's been the consistent message from all of our prime ministers for the last decade, including Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd. Um, and yeah, we, we treat coal mines. We want to ignore their emissions from burning the coal. And so we, it's like we put our fingers in our ears and basically say, la, 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 I can't hear you, climate change. So 
there's still ongoing massive debates about this in Australia. Now, there's no easy answers to this, um, but ignoring it won't go away. I've already talked or started the lecture talking about solutions and you need to make it a job. Can I just give you an idea, a couple of ideas that I'm working on just before we wrap up this lecture? So in the last 10 minutes, uh, I've been very critical of current Australian policies and saying they're inadequate, um, saying that we're in a lot of problems. How does that translate for you into your career? Um, I just wanted, I thought, I've been thinking about this quite a bit in recent weeks, and I just wanted to step away from things that are immediately relevant to you and your future careers, like greenhouse accounting. And I just want to give you some ideas about how, what I'm doing and how that might be relevant for you, because what I think you can do with your careers, you know, in, in this course, we've got amazing people. We've got environmental managers, town planners, uh, environmental engineers, chemical engineers, environmental scientists, uh, occupational health and safety um, students, a whole range of um, disciplines. And where you go in your career is, you know, you want to earn enough to you know, feed yourself, but you've got this incredible skill set going forward that uh, I just think don't waste it on just doing things for money. But use the skills you've got to do what you can to fight for solutions. And so I just wanted to give you an example, a personal one for me. So I'm a, a lawyer and I've got a science degree, but really law is my field. And so for the last 20 years, I've been or 15 years, I've been working on a lot of climate litigation. And a few years ago, I got involved in litigation about uh, forestry, illegal forestry in Papua New Guinea. And then... Uh, I've studied, been studying the legal system in PNG for that work. And while working on that, I had an idea that um, under the PNG constitution, there was a real opportunity for transnational um, claim by customary landholders in PNG to go after the big uh, emitters globally. And so I looked at Australia, where I've been doing a lot of work uh, on climate litigation. And in a recent article in the Environmental and Planning Law Journal proposed this idea, which now I'm trying to attract in um, other lawyers to work on it and funders to get it up off the ground. But basically it's an idea uh, that's set out. I've put a recording on my website uh, about identifying climate litigation opportunities. So this isn't, you know, this isn't things that I'm expecting you guys to know for the exam. This is purely big picture stuff. What can you do with your career? And to me, what I'm trying to do is look at all of the things I know at this stage of my career. What can I do that will have the most effect for um, protecting the environment, dealing with climate change? So an area where I think environmental lawyers like me can work is about linking uh, or attributing liability for big emitters. So at the moment, a big emitter like a big power station puts out all its pollution into the atmosphere and gets away with it. In Australia, they're not paying a price. There's no penalty for polluting the atmosphere and causing damage in Australia, but globally. So some of the impacts that are going to occur will be um, to destroy coral reefs throughout Southeast Asia and Papua New Guinea, as well as in the Great Barrier Reef. So my idea was, well, you know, can we sue? And so this article was written about identifying key issues and looking at a case study, some of the problems, like the legal issues are set out in the article. I don't want to dwell on them. But who can, who can sue is the idea. Well, I looked for um, opportunities for people to sue in PNG. There's customary landholders in PNG who, in PNG, you, um, if you're a customary landholder in, um, in an area like this, this was in the court cases I've been working on. This is a picture I took at one of the islands with basically people living on it. And uh, when I was there on a site visit in 2018, um, there was uh, dinner at night was um, basically everything had come off the um, surrounding coral reef. And I was there at dinner with all these people eating fish and mollusks and other things, except me, I'm, I'm vegetarian, so I wasn't eating any, any of the fish. But um, 
eating a lot of potato. Uh, but I, I was there at night time thinking, what are these people going to do when climate change destroys their reefs? You know, what are they going to eat? And I was really sad for a while. And then I was really angry. And then I thought, well, what can I do in terms of trying to help them on climate change? So I was there for um, illegal logging. But in terms of climate change, so propose this idea that um, why not sue some big um, power stations in Australia? So looking at the biggest emitters in Australia, they're down in Victoria. So in the Latrobe Valley, there's a series of big power stations. So focusing in on them, the biggest single emitter is Luyang A power station, which if we come down, um, here's Luyang A and Luyang B, and they're right beside this massive uh, coal mine, it's brown coal. And here's a couple of images of them, Luyang A in the foreground. So they're Australia's biggest emitters. Luyang A is shown in this graph. It emits about 19 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents a year. Now to give you some perspective on that. The entire country of PNG emits about 10 million tons. So this one power station is emitting nearly twice of what the entire country of Papua New Guinea is emitting. I just find it staggering that one emitter can be so big. So the idea with this court case is to sue on behalf of customary landholders in Papua New Guinea and sue the company that operates this power station for the damage that the power station and its emissions are causing to coral reefs in Papua New Guinea. And I'm excited about it. I think that it is a, um, I think that it has legs uh, legally, that the numbers are amazing. The fact that this one emitter is twice what the whole country of PNG is emitting should be something that uh, judges in Papua New Guinea can say, wow, that is massive. And the impacts are happening in Papua New Guinea. So uh, that means that you can sue in Papua New Guinea. So anyway, I won't dwell on the legal technicalities of it. Um, what I wanted to do was just basically say, here's an idea. Um, there's also been other litigation internationally, like the Ugenda case is really famous from the Netherlands, holding the um, Dutch government liable for not meeting its um, targets for 1.5 and 2 degrees under the Paris Agreement. Um, but I don't want to dwell on them. I just want to I'll skip over the carbon budget ideas to wrap up with a couple of points. The long and the short of... Um, my analysis that's been published in that Environmental and Planning Law Journal article is, can an Australian polluter be liable for damage in Papua New Guinea? And my view is yes. And at the moment, I'm using the skills I've got as a lawyer uh, to try and get a case like this up and running to change the whole um, liability for climate change regi regime not just in Australia, but globally. And I might not, might not succeed. I might, you know, the case may never get up. We, we, might, not, we might not find um, sufficient funding to run it. We might go to court and lose. The point that I really want to bring home to you, though, is think about the skills you've got. So you're not lawyers. Um, you work in your own field, whether you're a chemical engineer, an environmental manager, but... Look around in your field with the skills you've got and look for what can you do to make a difference. So that's what I'm certainly trying to do. Whether you succeed or not is a different um, question, but the very fact that you're trying to solve these huge problems that the world faces, I think that if you do that, uh, that's a great thing to do with your career. Okay. We're out of time. Uh, so we started with solutions for climate change and I really want to emphasize if we're going to solve climate change, we need to make it a job. We need to make it something that gives people employment and we also deal with poverty alleviation. If we don't do that, we're not going to win. And the failure of the carbon price in Australia 
really shows the toxic politics that um, exist if you can't, yeah, if you can't solve that um, problem of jobs and and showing that the solutions are actually going to generate jobs. We've run through briefly basic science and climate policy and particularly the 1.5 and 2 degree targets and some of the accounting framework, uh, the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act in Australia. Uh, that's the main thing I'd like you to take away from the lecture in terms of um, takeaway knowledge, the, the accounting framework, because that's relevant to the future regime. And then I just talk briefly in the last few minutes of the lecture about future opportunities and yeah, thinking about what you can do with your careers. The take home points to wrap up last slide, current international and Australian policy targets, even if achieved, will mean the loss of the Great Barrier Reef. Climate regulation is likely to evolve rapidly in the future in response to unacceptable impacts being felt. So as we see the loss of Great Barrier Reef, you know, ongoing um, massive bushfires in Australia, people demand action. The current Australian government, they took a lot of political heat in January, February for their inadequate response to the bushfires. And it's obvious that climate change is a massive problem and our current response is clearly failing. The third taken point is that the current accounting system for greenhouse gas emissions in Australia in the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act will form the cornerstone for any future response. So be aware of it, be aware of scope one, two, and three, and the basics about uh, carbon dioxide equivalents and how they're calculated. We currently largely ignore responsibility for greenhouse emissions from coal and gas exports in Australia. And yeah, I would just say finally, we need inspiring solutions and we need to fight for the future we want. And in your future careers, use the skills you've got to fight for those solutions.